Hello, and welcome to Finding Common Ground. This civic media education program is produced by WCKN, student-run cable television of Clarkson University. The program is a partnership production of Clarkson Center for Excellence in Communication, St. Lawrence County of Chapter of the American Association of University Women, and the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters and Seedcorn. My name is Edward Eskew. I'm a student in a course at Clarkson called Mass Media and Society. I, and a number of my classmates, provide a production crew for this series. The opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers who do not represent the views of the producers, WCKN, or Clarkson University. Welcome to Finding Common Ground, produced at the WCKN studios in collaboration with the League of Women Voters, the American Association of University Women, and Seed Corn. I'm your moderator, Elizabeth Lyons. With a swirling debate around renewable energy sources to reduce dependence on fossil fuels and the need for environmentally responsible ways to power our homes, the issue of wind development is front and center both nationally and in many St. Lawrence County communities. For some, it has become an increasingly divisive, emotional issue in which opposing sides have become deeply entrenched in their views and there is little or no hope for compromise. How do we work through these differences to find ways to alleviate concerns by both sides? The intent of this project is to see if we can find people who can put their respective ideologies aside and listen to each other in order to find common values that will lead to solutions to problems. In this series, we are putting together panels of people to talk about these issues and to work together to find ways to move past division. To help us do that, our website is intended to let you read about the issues and help us frame questions that will help us reach solutions to these problems. Joining us today on our first panel to examine wind power and the broader issue of home rule, which will come later in the program, are Jason Fotenauer, Deputy Director of the St. Lawrence County Planning Office, Carrie Tremper, Parishville Town Councilwoman, and Robin McClellan, Adjunct Instructor of Alternative and Renewable Power at SUNY Canton. Wind energy development is coming out quickly in our region. We, have already, we already have wind development in Chateaugay and the Tug Hill Plateau. There are 700 megawatts of power being produced in the state and there are plans for 8,000 more. On the surface, the advent of wind power is a good thing. It fulfills a need for green renewable energy, but it is not without its problems. Uh, Robin, do you want to take us through some of the problems? Sure. Uh, like virtually all solutions, this renewable power source has presented problems. And, and first thing is the health effects. And flicker and wind turbine syndrome. Another problem is bird and bat kill. And a third issue is the economic disparity between the benefits and the costs. Uh, and it's significant and it's led to a lot of uh, divisiveness within, a, within communities. Uh, can, can you talk about what some of the health problems are associated with turbines? Well, the main one uh, that we see is, is flicker. Uh, and that's when the uh, sun is behind a wind turbine and that flicker, that shadow, falls on a house. And it has a, a, a pattern of repeating that's pretty quick. What And normally that's just a problem for a few minutes and for many people it's not a problem. But somebody who has epilepsy, it's going to be a fairly significant problem. The other problem is wind turbine syndrome. And uh, Dr. Nina Pierpont, who's actually in Malone, has done started to do some research on it. But it's a relatively new field. There's been some research done in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, but it generally has led, they've, they've found that it's led to sleep disturbance, headache, uh, tinnitus, which is a ringing in the ears, ear pressure, dizziness, uh, nausea, visual blurring, uh, tachycardia, which is rapid heart rate, uh, irritability, and uh, problems with concentration and memory. Aren't there also some environmental problems, and how, how can we mitigate these problems? Well, there have been some problems with bird and bat kill, and bird and, uh, and, and it's often related to where the tower is sighted. If you sight these on a flyway, you're going to have problems. The bat kill is a little different. It has a different uh, mode. It doesn't actually hit the bat. It actually, de the bat misses the, the blade, but uh, the wind actually, the low pressure actually causes their lungs to collapse. The, uh, the bird and bat kill uh, have been studied to some extent, but it hasn't been, there's not a lot of it. The other problems are the problems that are dealt with with whenever you have a construction project. So you have soil compaction and things like that. Uh, but those are pretty well, those are, those are things we can, we can deal with and we can mitigate most of those too. 
What are the economic uh, effects, Robin? Well, the main economic effects are the, those of disparity. So the leaseholder gets a lease, and the lease is for the tower base, but the impact of that tower is far greater than just the base of the tower. It extends uh, from a visual perspective, as far as you can see, but from, a, from the point of view of these uh, wind turbine syndrome, which is generally thought to be caused by low frequency rumble, uh, it depends on the geog geology of the area, so that those things uh, impact far beyond the, the lease. Uh, so those, that's the main problem of the economics. Uh, the other problem is uh, the property values. Property values can be degraded quite a bit by the presence of wind turbines, and there's some studies that are starting to show this uh, fairly, uh, fairly succinctly. Uh, and finally, uh, the utility often pays a, a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes, to the community, or there's a tax, so there's a benefit to the community. We don't know whether that benefit is really uh, commensurate with uh, impact. Well, and, and one of the more obvious negative effects that I think we've probably all seen in one shape or another is, is the divisiveness that happens between, you know, people in communities that are wrestling with this issue. Um, you know, my brother-in-law has a wind lease in another community, um, and so, and he was a town official there. And so I've seen firsthand, um, you know, some of the, the divisiveness that he had to put up with. And, and plus, I wrote an editorial earlier this year in which I, I didn't take a stance on, you know, whether wind power was a good thing or a bad thing. But, you know, I still got hate mail for months afterwards, you know, from people who, you know, because they knew that my brother-in-law had a wind lease, they thought that, you know, that had me biased somehow. And, you know, it has nothing to do with my feelings on it. So... You know, I mean, Carrie, can you talk about, you know, some of, some of what you've seen in your community in that vein? Um, yes, the, the town of Parishville right now is putting together a uh, wind law. Um, and we've had many public meetings. And in these meetings, the residents have addressed concerns. Um, some of these concerns, obviously, what Robin mentioned earlier, the property values. You know, they're concerned with their property values going down if a wind turbine is set up next to their home. Um, obviously, the health effects often are also mentioned by Robin. Um, a big one was loss of farmland. Um, you know, we lose, I don't know the figures, but we lose farmland exponentially each year. Um, another one was the secrecy wrapped around the whole lease. Um, when, when one person enters into a lease with one of these wind companies, they um, have to sign basically non-disclosure so they can't tell people you know and they can't talk about any of the issues or problems they're having with these wind lease, um, with these wind farm companies um, carrier there are there is there another side what are there tangible benefits to the the town as well y yes and there are I mean the first one obviously you know we look at is the tax benefits you know how how is the town going to benefit you know basically we're going to get some type of tax repayment. They they won't go by a taxable um, assessment. They basically will do a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes. Um, problems with that is that um, we we also have brass can in our community, and um, we can't offer them a payment in lieu of taxes, or we don't really want to offer them a payment in lieu of taxes because how do you quantify? what they should be paying as, you know, the wind farms. What, what's Bra Braskin is the hydropower? The hydropower, you know, they run the dams, the power dams in our, and um, obviously Parishville has five, six, a large amount, and now we're looking at having the wind farms come in and how do we tax them? It, it gets kind of unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> so what what is the town putting in into the law that will address some of the environmental and, and health impacts? Okay, primarily we're doing that through setbacks, um, restrictions for from existing homes, roads, um, property lines. Um, we're also trying to address the loss of um, farmland through. Um, Siting goals that were set up through um, the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. They have a guidelines. Um, so we set that, we put that right in our law. And um, lastly, we put in our law a way to um, 
mitigate nuisance um, complaints that we, we have a, a complaint resolution program. So if there is, you know, somebody's having a negative problem with say flicker that they didn't, uh, you know, that the wind farm didn't see was going to affect this house, they, they're supposed to, you know, at least address it and with, you know, timeline and follow through and all that. Does the town get involved in actually addressing the conflict? Um, n not necessarily. I mean, basically, the wind farm has to is supposed to do a study of the surrounding area of where they're going to put their turbine up and how it's going to affect everything. Um, and then, if obviously, there's some negative effects. They have to. They're supposed to address it. I guess I, I would think the town would probably get involved if the wind farm wasn't, you know, coming back with some mitigation efforts. So, you know, swirling around all of this, the, um, the state recently passed and the governor signed into law the Power New York Act. Um, and, and so that, at least on the surface, because, you know, we, we're still kind of analyzing what it means, um, but it appears to shift a lot of the power to regulate wind power from local governments to the state. Um, and so, Jason, can, can you explain what the situation is with the Power New York Act? Sure, Beth. What the Power New York Act does is, uh, amongst other things, it's, it's quite a, a lengthy document, but how it relates to wind is it reinstates uh, what's known as Article 10, which is sort of a buzzword associated with, with wind development. And what Article, uh, what the, the New York Act, Power New York Act does with Article 10 is that it, it reinstates and um, uh, revises it a little bit uh, Article 10 is, is a public services law that was in effect actually <clears throat> from 1992 to 2002 which gives authority to the state through a siting panel to uh, regulate and have final say on the development of uh, wind projects. And what's different with the, the newer version of, of Article 10 is that uh, in the past uh, wind projects or any power generation project of 80 megawatts was controlled by the state. Now it's been reduced to 25 megawatts. So you'll have uh, a, uh, you could see a, a wind development as small as, as 10 towers being uh, taken over and regulated by the state siting panel. And that certainly could apply to some of the proposals around here, yes. Certainly, yeah. There are there are uh, the um, I think the, the the Stone Church proposal in the uh, the Hammond area, Hammond, uh, Morristown, Oswegatchie <coughs> development. I believe is, is 75 uh, towers. Uh, so that would be um, you know, towers are usually two and a half to three megawatts, depending on. Uh, what type of tower you, you have. So, so that would certainly fall under Article 10. So it also establishes a, a siting review panel. Yeah. And <clears throat> what was the purpose of that panel? Well, the, the panel, uh, <coughs> I think the intent of the panel was to uh, streamline the process, I guess, and, and maybe <coughs> make it more uniform across the state, across the state Robin. Uh, right now, uh, wind development is, is regulated uh, at, uh, or, uh, like any other land use, um, at the local level through local uh, zoning regulations and, <coughs> and uh, local laws. Uh, through having a, a siting panel that is, uh, I guess, uh, more of a, a, a state, well, it is a state-run entity, it would take out the, um, the ability of individual municipalities to have different regulations for these types of towers. Also, the, um, the, the process uh, right now can be really slow. It, it, it is often bogged down through litigation. Uh, municipalities that aren't, aren't happy with how a, uh, a plan or a, uh, a regulation is developing will will uh, sue and that delays the process and the uh, I believe the intent of the governor is to to uh, make that process uh, more expeditious, and there is an, a, a time frame, a 12-month time frame. Once an application uh, has been finalized, that uh, you you need to move forward within 12 months of of that application being developed. So, who who sits on this siting panel? 
I bet there are uh, seven members in total. Uh, five members are state officials. The, the, it's chaired by the, uh, the, uh, the head of the Public Service Commission. Also at the table from the state is the uh, Department of Conservation, the DEC, uh, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, uh, <coughs> the uh, Department of Health and uh, Economic Development. Did I mention them? Yeah, they're the fifth, Economic Development. And then the two other seats are reserved for individuals at the, uh, at the local level. So two representatives from the community in which a wind development uh, is happening would have a, a seat at that table. Okay, so this is going to, you know, directly affect my town, mm -hmm. um, and we're putting in a uh, local law in place. Right. I mean, how how is that going to affect? Uh, how is our local law? Is it just going to be over overridden right. by this that, panel? And that's that's what everybody is sort of, I guess, up in arms about with this uh, with this uh, and the impact on on home rule. How? How is our uh, how is our authority, our local authority, to regulate what happens in our community affected by this type of development and or this type of, of law? And it, it is significant. Certainly, anything uh, as I mentioned, anything over uh, the twenty five megawatts uh, would go to this panel. So in in Parishville, for example, if there was a, a development that was under twenty five megawatts, your local law would still be uh, on the books. Would still be what what would would be in effect. And um, so it's, I think it's, it's, it's important for municipalities to have that type of, of uh, law in place. Uh, but yes, there is language in the law that says the, the, the panel, the siting plan panel has to uh, follow the, the local laws that are in place. However, if it's deemed to be uh, unreasonably burdensome, I think is the language uh, in, the, in the law, if it is unreasonably burdensome, burdensome, then they have the authority, the siting panel has the authority to, to override what the local municipality has on their books. So it could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing because you said there are some experts on this panel that could help right. possibly these local governments. Certainly the, the Department of Health is, is there at the table. They would bring forward um, all their expertise. Their, their reason for being is to promote and, and uh, ensure the, the health of the, the citizens of the state of New York. So uh, if there are health effects from shadow flicker, um, th they, those certainly should be studied. Uh, also the DEC is there. Uh, they, uh, again, the, their, uh, their directive is to ensure uh, the, the, the environment, the, uh, the natural environment, the, 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 uh, the birds and the bats are are protected. Uh, so there, there is room, certainly, uh, on this panel for all those, those uh, representatives to bring the, the full, the full um, knowledge base of their respective departments to bear on, on this. Well, one of the problems is that those knowledge bases aren't very big right now. And hopefully they would be able to manage to go out and actually wait, do some studies. Right. Uh, the question is, will they take the time to do the studies where the political pressure and the pressure for quite legitimate pressure for having alternative energy right. override that? Right. And, and the hope is that they, uh, they will not. And there is, uh, there is quite a bit of language in the, the, the law that addresses uh, the environmental concerns. Environmental justice is a, a term that is, is, uh, is, is sprinkled throughout the, the uh, Power New York Act of 2011, so certainly the intent to make sure that that, that does happen. And so, you know, I mean, taking all of these things into consideration and, you know, people have a tendency to focus on the things that they're concerned about and the things that, that there, I mean, there are obviously some very legitimate worries in this, in this issue. So, you know, what do we do to come up with ways to surmount some of these obstacles and kind of make sure that everybody's fears are put to rest? Um, you know, to me, the, the first thing that comes to mind is for a local government to be open and transparent about what they're doing. You know, I, I think that town boards and, and, you know, whatever local government is focusing on this issue really needs to make sure that everyone in the community gets a say. You know, that they all have 
you know, a chance to air their concerns and that the local government works to meet those concerns, you know, and, and make sure that people understand that, that they're listening and, and be very, very open about everything that they do, all of the talks they have with these developers, um, you know, and, and to have to let leaseholders have a spot at the table too, so that, you know, it's not this us versus them kind of mentality. Um, I, I think that's a great point, Beth, and, and to go along with that, that open mentality is uh, to, to uh, look where other communities uh, have gone with this. Other communities have struggled with this uh, as well. Uh, Carrie, you know, in Parrishville, uh, the, uh, the law that you're writing uh, is, is not the first one for a municipality in the, in the in, certainly not in the state and certainly not even in St. Lawrence County. There are a number of other municipalities that have uh, laws on the books, so there is, there is some opportunity there to see what other communities are doing and, and look at uh, also to the state, to NYSERDA, uh, for um, examples of, of uh, language and, and ways that we can, we can mitigate the, mm -hmm. uh, the concerns that go along with the development. And, and I think in the town of Parishville, we are doing that. We are sharing our ideas with um, the town of Hopkins, since the wind farm mm -hmm. that is coming to our area is going to um, encompass both those towns. Um, I think one of the concerns also that was um, brought to us in these public meetings was um, why can't we cite some of these, um, you know, these wind farms on state and county lands that would, um, you know, the it's you know, public utility, then it would be on a public land, it would benefit all the community instead of just, you know, the leaseholder or, you know, there's, it goes back to what Beth says, us versus them, mm. you know, the, the few people that are going to make the money off the wind farm and then the other people standing there saying, what's in it for me? Could have public benefit for on public land. So exactly. The, uh, I guess another opportunity where there uh, to go along with this uh, what other communities are doing is just to uh, just to make sure that the rules that are in place uh, are uh, are going to help with some of the concerns like the the shadow flicker and some of the other uh, environmental problems I know uh, setback issues although setbacks certainly cannot solve all problems with with wind towers there's a, a number of concerns with uh, geology so one setback that works in one community may not work in another community because you may need to be further away because of the uh, further away from from development uh, residential development or, or other type of development when you're putting up a, a tower depending on what's underneath the ground uh, but uh, there there certainly is a way to get that that that's the tower further back from a, a residence to uh, to mitigate the the flicker. At least reduce and, it. Uh, reduce it. Yeah, it, the, the, I think there's some some give and take with with uh, uh, any new type of <laughs> industrial development, which right. this with wind farms really are. It's 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 not as not like a steel plant, but it isn't still an industrial development. Yeah, you have the flicker, and then you also have your your noise and rumble. Um, that they say there's like an infrasound that goes, you know, mm. through the soil and can affect these homes. And again, I think I'm hoping that you know through more research we can find out you know how that actually affects people. So you know that's one of the things we need to do is do more research. It's a relatively new form. But um, one of the other things that was brought to our attention too was you know, how will this benefit me or my town? And, and can we keep this low cost power here in our own, you know, little corner, you know, if we could power the school and, you know, get at least some benefits in that respect, economic benefits back to your own town. It makes people more interested in having these, um, you know, intrusive wind towers come into your, community if you're going to get some economic benefit. Right, and right now we produce a good percentage of the power that was used in New York, and most of it's uh, done with hydropower, which is good, clean power. 
but we don't get much of the benefit. NIPA owns the big dam in Messina and Braskan and, and uh, Brookfield on the, on the uh, dams along the racket. That's a lot of power produced. And we do get some benefits from it, but if we were to have actually owned that power, we wouldn't be the poorest county in, San, in New York State anymore. Uh, and in, the other problem that we have with wind power is, is this disparity in economic developments on the smaller scale, on the private scale. So harmonizing the economic benefits with the costs of having wind power seems like it would be really important. And I'm working with the town of Stockholm to craft our wind law. We're trying to get our wind law started in case somebody comes in. So we're not stuck in this horrible, divisive struggle that so many communities are. But one of the ideas that I've had is that in addition to the lease, that the wind company would have to buy an easement or lease an easement uh, uh, for the, the areas that was affected by it. So that would start to spread the, the benefit out among the people who are impacted. Uh, I just wanted to add too that the transparency shouldn't, shouldn't just stop with government. It really needs to be transparent in the in the, the company level too. The wind power companies need to be forthcoming about re, uh, releasing information about uh, about the leases and about how much power is produced. A lot of people have complained that while the wind power is up there, they're not really producing the amount of power that we would uh, we would like them to produce. So uh, and or that that we should produce. This is good, clean power. One of the problems may be that it's also good, clean, expensive power. And so mm -hmm. when, when you have to buy it on the open market like Alcoa does, they're not going to say, oh, good, let's buy wind power. It's eight cents a kilowatt hour when we can get it at four from someplace else. Well, and the, the difference is there that, you know, we, we have laws on the books that compel local governments to be transparent right. and and we don't have that for private right. companies so it's really a decision that the company powers that we need to make um, you know if they want to foster goodwill within a community then they you know they really need to think about how much information they should be sharing right and they have uh, and they make that decision in the uh, view of, of their profits. Is it more profitable for us to share information or is it more profitable and more expeditious for us to come in and, and uh, develop our base and build on that base? And clearly that's been the way things have happened in a lot of ways. It's done in mining, it's done in a lot of different mm -hmm. areas. So, I know that uh, I think we're running short of time here, but uh, just one, one last thought on, on openness. There was uh, back when um, Governor Cuomo was the Attorney General. There was a, uh, a truth in uh, uh, a full disclosure uh, requirement put in place for wind uh, wind companies. Uh, I'm, I think it was in '09. Uh, so there there is the uh, the desire by the state to ensure that there is some some openness uh, at that level as well at the corporate level. Great. It certainly would help in the town of Parishville because. Yeah. There's definitely some <laughs> concerns on whether, you know, the wind farms are telling us the real truth. Right. Well, and, and the, the best you can do is to be proactive, and, and that's what your town and, and you're working with the town yep. of Stockholm to make that happen. So, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, one, that's a part of this puzzle to try to, you know, keep the, keep the division down and make sure that everybody's concerns are, are heard and, and mitigated. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, right, and we and it's so important. I would encourage towns that don't have a wind law in place to start putting putting one in place, and even laws on fracking in the same, which are it's the same kind of an issue, only even more money at stake there. Whenever there's money at stake and start and it starts to get disparate, there are problems. I'm sorry, we're out of time. On behalf of the organizers. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to talk with us and for your, will your willingness to participate in the local civic media program. Please come back next week for another Canon Conversations. Until then, remember, our North Country matters.